Okay, so yeah, this is going to be a, a, a chalk talk. Um, but I guess the first thing uh, I should thank is uh, Money for actually setting up a couple of the terminology and, and, the, uh, and, and, and sort of the coordinate system. So what I want to talk about today is uh, geostrophy and quasi-geostrophy. Um, so some of this might be uh, something that you know, but I know there's a, it's sort of a mixed audience, so I'm going to assume very, very little, so I apologize if it's boring some people. Hopefully you'll get something out of it. Um, so there's a, a, a dual intent uh, to this talk, so it's not just meant to introduce you to this idea of what geostrophy and quasi-geostrophy is, but to sort of give an idea that uh, the way you get these type of equations is sort of generic. Um, in fact, it's, you know, as someone who does PDEs on a wide range of applications, you see the same trick apply all the time. So I want to give you a flavor for why and how you go about seeing that structure. Um, so, okay, so the first thing I want to do is start with the same picture that Mani had, which is, you know, so I'm going to assume that there's a planet that rotates. Uh, so suppose this is planet Earth. Um, so then there's our little r. Let's keep some theta. So as money had this uh, coordinate system, uh, let's say a locally so there's a z hat, and then there's a y hat, right? So money had this local coordinate system. And he said that, you know, you can have the same rotation rate here. And you want to know what the local uh, normal rotation rate is. So I'm going to assume that there is a, let's make this bigger, thin fluid layer uh, on the sphere. Um, and of course, uh, I think we'll all recognize uh, the equations of motion. So they'll look something like this. Uh, is minus one over rho, gradient of p, um, minus two omega cross u, um, plus an omega squared r, and, and maybe a, a g, some sort of body force. Okay, so the effects of rotation are really to introduce two things, something called the Coriolis term, and this is basically the centripetal acceleration. Okay? Uh, for the most part, we don't have to worry about the centripetal acceleration, because if g itself was some gradient of some potential, then I can just absorb uh, omega squared into that gradient, because then this is just nothing but the gradient. It's just a gradient of an r squared, and so I can just absorb that into the potential. So it's just a redefinition of that. So for the most part, dynamically, this guy doesn't play any role. Um, this one is much more interesting. So the Coriolis term is a lot more interesting, um, and one way to sort of see that is, suppose you're standing at the North Pole. Let's say this is the North Pole. And then it's precisely uh, an omega, right? So we're rotating in that direction. And suppose I'm traveling in the direction given by the ve velocity. And then so I end up with the cross product in this direction. So what that means is if you're traveling, you get deflected, right? So the f 2 omega cross u gives you a force onto your, uh, um, that acts on your acceleration, so it changes your velocity vector. So in any uh, situation where you are traveling in the northern hemisphere, you get deflected to the right. So that's a useful thing to keep in mind. In the northern hemisphere, deflect to the right. And then in the southern hemisphere, you deflect to the left. 
So some of you may recall from the first lecture, um, we had these pictures of uh, surface winds that were coming in from the southern hemisphere and then turning to the right in the northern hemisphere. This is precisely what that, why that's happening. So the very reason that the trade winds themselves have a direction is because of the Coriolis term. And what was described in the first lecture was a trade wind that was somehow crossing the uh, equator. So it's a southern trade wind that ends here. You had that reversal of a direction. Right? So deflect to the right in the northern hemisphere, deflect to the left in the southern hemisphere. All right? OK, so there are a number of assumptions that we can make on this set of equations um, to reduce our complexity. So I'm going to just state what those assumptions are. So I'm going to say that. Um, for the most part, I will be uh, interested only in a small region on the sphere. Uh, so I don't want to include the fact that it is a sphere. I just want to approximate it by a Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, I also want to assume, emphasize the fact that it's a thin fluid. So I'm going to neglect vertical variations quite a bit. Right? Um, I'm going to neglect vertical variations unless they are vertical variations of maybe the vertical velocity. That I'll keep. But the vertical velocity itself, I'll say, is much smaller. Okay? Um, and of course, as you can already see, I've neglected viscosity. Right? Um, and uh, the, the, the final assumption is to really think that uh, vertical variations of the horizontal velocity field are minimal. One way to think about what I've really done in that assumption is to say that everything has been averaged in the vertical. I'm only looking at average, vertically averaged horizontal velocity fields. Okay? All right, very good. So when you do all of this, uh, I'll move to this side because I want to use it again and again. Um, you end up with, so with some abuse of notation, where now u is a horizontal velocity. cross u is minus 1 over rho, grad p, t plus divergence, uh, is 0. And then we have a, something like an equation of state. So H is the layer thickness. And our Earth is the radius of Earth. So I've actually made one assumption which I didn't uh, mention, which is in the vertical, we'll always assume a hydrostatic balance. Um, turns out that's a very good assumption when you compare it to data on the largest length scales. Um, I don't want to imply that there is a rigorous de derivation from this set of equations to those set of equations. Uh, it's a delicate matter. Um, certain assumptions uh, can be made, but it's not at all obvious that they, that they hold in some limiting fashion in a rigorous mathematical sense. Nonetheless, this set of equations turns out to be extraordinarily useful, and I think that's the real reason you should work with them. It's a, it's a simplifying model uh, that, that, is, that has a lot of value. Okay? Um, all right, so... Ah, I forgot to mention. F is, as Money mentioned, 2 omega, let's say some fixed sine theta z naught. I could have added a beta term, and I'll add it later on, but I kind of want to just uh, keep equations simple for now, and then also emphasize the fact that many of the additional complexities come along for the ride. Um, the, the hard part is not there. All right, very good. Um, all right, so what is geostrophy? As Mani mentioned, it is the balance between the pressure term and 
uh, the Coriolis term. So what that means is the dominant balance, basically neglect everything else, is this. Written in component form, remember this is just a horizontal velocity. We get the velocity in the y direction is dx of p. Velocity in the u direction is dy of p. In other words, just to be completely clear about what we've done, We have defined a stream function. You give me a pressure, I get velocities. There's a stream function. It is not at all obvious that every solution to this set of equations has a stream function. And it's not true. Not every set of equations, uh, solutions do. But this particular balance does. And so sometimes this is also referred to as a, uh, a balanced uh, set of equations. What are the consequences of having a stream function? The divergence of u is zero. Again, that's not true for every solution to this set of equations. Only the geostrophic balance in the shallow water equations has the divergence of u to be zero. Right? The other thing, which is possibly a little counterintuitive, that the velocity is in a direction that is perpendicular to the pressure gradient. Usually, pressure drives a flow. So if you have a pipe with a head, the flow is along the head, head difference, right? From high pressure to low pressure. That's not what's happening over here. Pressure, uh, the velocity is along uh, isobars, constant pressure lines. All right. This is also 100% an apparent effect. Please don't get it that this is, like, this is because of our coordinate system, right? So if you go tell a physicist, they will get, you know, kind of upset about these things. Um, it's because we're on a non-inertial frame of reference, right? So that's, that's, that's a key point. Nonetheless, since we are on a non-inertial frame of reference, you should take it into account when you make predictions, right? All your measurements, at least on, on land, are being made in that frame of reference. Um, what it also means is, suppose you have the following scenario, where you have a blob of high pressure surrounded by uh, low pressure, you end up with the flow rotating in that direction if F points out of the plane. So naturally, things start rotating. Okay. Uh, likewise, if you had a low pressure, uh, then it rotates in that direction. Again, in the, uh, in the case where F points out of the plane, and you think of that as being in the upper hemisphere. Uh, northern hemisphere, that's true. Southern, flip the two. Right. Um, oh, and yeah. Not only is it the case that you give me any pressure, then I have a geostrophic balance that gives me these two velocities, that these velocities that satisfy these conditions. It is also true that the associated height is steady. Right? So I can obviously write uh, u to be minus g over f uh, hx, v to be minus g over f hy, since h and h are related. And then this immediately implies, um, if you plug it in here, so you actually have a steady flow. So it must be steady. So it's in geostrophic balance, and it is steady. Okay. So geostrophy has a bunch of assumptions, uh, ha has a bunch of consequences. The assumption is these are the dominating uh, forces, and then immediately you have a divergence free flow, which is perpendicular to the pressure gradient and is steady. 
But it's also true for any function h of xy. You get to pick any function h of xy, and this is true. Right? So that should worry you a little bit. Was there a question? Uh, u is driven by the y, yes. And uh, one of them gets a... Huh? Say that again louder. It hasn't vanished, it's there. Divergence of u h. Plug in u and v over here, and you immediately get that that goes to zero. If you think about what you've done, is you've made an assumption, and that means usually you've forgotten something. And so the fact that this is true for any h, you want to recover h now by putting the assumption back in. So putting the stuff you threw away, which is to say this bit, <laughs> will tell you which h you're interested in. Okay? Uh, set in a much more loose sense, the function h evolves slowly. So on a certain time scale, its time derivative is zero. On a longer time scale, its time derivative is not zero. Okay? So this idea of multiple time scales sort of comes in very naturally. Very good. Uh, so the whole point of quasi-geostrophy is another way of saying it's sort of kind of geostrophic. That's what the word quasi means. <laughs> That's a precise mathematical definition, that's right. So we want to break away from the, uh, the dominant balance with the Coriolis term and start including uh, nonlinear terms. But as Eric already pointed out, no one really knows what to do with nonlinear PDEs other than maybe derive them. Um, but I'll come to some comments towards the, towards the end about what we, what we would like to do with these sort of nonlinear PDEs. Um, the point being, we somehow need to incorporate the nonlinearity, but we don't want to incorporate the full nonlinearity because then you haven't really kept some level of simplification. Okay? So, in a suitable non dimensional scheme, That's to say, I'm scaling variables appropriately such that the following is true. Minus grad uh, eta. I'll explain all these terms. Epsilon d eta dt plus divergence eta u plus Divergence u is zero, where the old h has been non-dimensionalized such that the following is true. The new h, the non-dimensional h, is a constant one plus a deviation. So I've just pulled out the mean value of, of h, if you want to think about it. Okay? Uh, So what is this particular non-dimensional scaling? Well, first of all, let me define what epsilon is. Epsilon is what you call the Rosby number. That's that. Okay. So u is a typical uh, velocity scale. L is a typical length scale. Um, eta by h, again with abusive notation, the eta here is non-dimensional. The eta there is dimensional. What did I do? It is epsilon. L over LD squared, where LD is something called the Rosby deformation radius. So capital H is like a mean height. And so with the acceleration due to gravity and the frequency F naught, 
F0 is nothing but 2 omega sine theta. Okay? So I can define that. So what I'm really looking at is length scales along this, uh, on this order of magnitude. A mean height, the mean uh, depth, uh, mean layer depth. Oh, sorry, little e is epsilon. Epsilon is the Rosby number. All right. So I've also implicitly assumed that the time scale I'm interested in is the one set by the Rosby uh, number. Right? So it's a long time scale that I'm really interested in. So that's to overcome this fact. That on a short time scale, nothing happens. I need to go to a long time scale to see something interesting. Okay? All right, so uh, these set of equations have a particular form. where Q is U V eta, L Q is uh, minus V plus eta X, U plus eta Y, U X plus V Y. Um, and N of Q, if I can get this, is B U D T, d eta dt, divergence of eta u. Note there are two components in the first one. Right? Everything is the same length. All right, so any weakly nonlinear theory always looks like that. Uh, any linear theory equals when epsilon is zero. Right? So when epsilon is zero, we know how to solve things. You usually just take a Fourier transform or something, and you get a solution. Um, and now we want to solve a weakly nonlinear theory. Okay, so the idea is fairly straightforward. You take an epsilon expansion. Fairly straightforward idea, and we'll go term by term. You have order one, Not is, uh, well, uh, might as well write it this way, minus v naught plus eta naught x, u naught plus eta naught y, u naught x plus v naught y. Allegedly should be 0, 0, 0. It looks like a set of differential equations to solve, but it's surprisingly easy, because it basically says, pick any eta, v equals eta x, u equals minus eta y, and then this is automatically true. Right? So just as before, when we had this situation, where if we had this particular structure of a stream function, we automatically satisfied the divergence uh, condition, q naught can be written basically as minus eta naught y, eta naught x, eta, for any eta, naught. Right? So that's clearly uh, just solving for uh, each component. Any questions about that? Very good. Order one. L of Q1 plus N of Q0 is zero. Uh, yes. Well, OK. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is there any restriction? Oh, I mean, in a, in a strict mathematical sense, this series doesn't even converge. So don't, don't even go there. Uh, <laughs> um, 
the, the way I like to think about this is sort of to get an idea for what the solution ought to look like, an approximation to the solution. And it's really an ansatz. And you'll find out in just a second, I won't even solve for Q1. Turns out that's not what I'm even interested in. Um, but I'll come to that in a little bit. Okay? Uh, for, if you want to make it a rigorous mathematical argument, you basically do the same thing, but a little bit more bookkeeping, um, and be a little bit more precise on how you define certain things. And then you actually don't include the dot, dot, dot. You just stop there and say, there's a correction that I can always find. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is there another question? Okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, all right. So, how do we solve these type of equations? I no longer need the, this part. The way I like to think about these is forget about the fact that there's differential operators. What would you do if it was a matrix? Right? Just pretend you knew this, and then this is just a matrix equation. So consider the following. AX equals B. Someone gave you B, you want to find this. It'll be order, it'll all be the Q zeros, because I've already got an epsilon up front. And N is all of this stuff. So if I want order one here, I've got an epsilon already. So this had better be order zero in epsilon, the lowest order stuff. That's really crucial. <laughs> that's, that's a remark, it's incredibly crucial, because if, if Q1 appeared here, I'm kind of stoked. <laughs> um, as you'll see, I don't know how to solve for Q1 in just a while. Just, just hold that thought, and, and it should, should hopefully clarify on its own. Okay? All right, so as I said, pick any eta, zero, you get a Q0, we'll just pretend we know this. And then now we have LQ1 plus something we know, which is an equation of that form, right? So how do you solve such a thing? Well, if determinant of A is not zero, then clearly I know how to solve this. I claim determinant of A is zero, right? In our case, determinant of A is zero. Because this is entirely equivalent to their existing sum function x, or sum vector x, such that ax equals zero. And that's literally what the order, the zeroth order uh, equation told us. Right? So um, LQ naught equals zero, 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 and I found a Q, which was non zero. So. We are not in this region. In fact, it wouldn't be interesting if we were in this region. It would only be interesting if, if determinant of A was zero. Okay. okay? So what do you do in this case? Well, and let's wrap this as I picked any y, and I just multiplied it on the left. But if I chose the right y that was in the null space of A transpose, then all of the left-hand side goes to 0. So y transpose b is 0 if A transpose y is 0. So sometimes this goes by the name of the fret home alternative. The alternative is either the determinant is non-zero, or if it is 0, you have to satisfy this condition. This doesn't give you a solution. It just says there's a solution only if you pick the right B. You don't get to put an arbitrary vector on the right-hand side. It has to satisfy a condition. So sometimes this goes by the phrase, the solvability condition. Okay? What does that mean? For us, we are in a similar situation. That means n of q naught can't be picked arbitrarily. 
it must somehow be perpendicular to things that are in the null space of A transpose, or in this case, the null space of L transpose. Okay, so this is where now you have to know a little bit more mathematics. Uh, for matrices, transposes are well-defined. What do I mean by a transpose of a differential operator? Uh, what do I mean by perpendicular? Right? Um, so I need to define those things. Um, Yes, I can get rid of this stuff. So very briefly, two functions, f of x, g of x, are perpendicular if, and only if, in certain circumstances, f of x, g of x, dx is zero. So I'll define the dot product this way. And for two vector functions, that is vec uh, a vector of functions, let's say q tilde q, are perpendicular if q tilde dot q dx is 0 which in our notation is something like a u tilde u, v tilde v, eta tilde eta. That's how I'll define perpendicular. Okay? Very good. Now I'm in a scope to actually define what I mean by uh, transpose of L. A tilde is a vector with the tilde components. Q is the vector with the Q components. So Q tilde is U tilde, V tilde, eta tilde. Q is U, V, eta. Right, so it's like taking a dot product over the vectors, but then the function, so integrate. All right. I'll define uh, L transpose, where L is an operator, as L transpose Q tilde dot Q dx should equal Q tilde dot LQ. I know what L is. I need to find out what L transpose is, but it's all under an integral. So the actual operative way to do it is integration by parts. That's all you're doing. You're just taking a dot product and doing integration by parts. OK? So I'll leave that as an exercise to do, and then just state what L tilde is, or L transpose. So in this case, you can show that L transpose Q tilde turns out to be the following. V tilde minus eta tilde x minus u tilde minus eta tilde y minus of these guys. Okay, so it turns out when you do integration by parts, using the definition of L and then just integrate by parts and then realize what L transpose ought to be, you end up with the following structure. The nice thing is the function Q tilde that makes L transpose 0 is actually of the same kind that makes L 0, because it has exactly the same form. V should be an eta x, U should be a minus eta y, and then this is automatically true. Right? So you kind of know. So. Q tilde should equal, let's say, uh, minus psi y, psi x, psi. Or any psi. What that means is, when we want to solve this particular equation, the solvability condition
is psi. Uh, let me call this uh, Q tilde L Q1 plus Q tilde N of Q0 should be 0. Okay. Where Q tilde is precisely this guy. By definition, this is L transpose Q tilde Q1 plus Q tilde N of Q0. I've chosen Q tilde so that L transpose Q tilde goes to 0 for any psi. So then my entire uh, equation for quasi-geostrophy Quasi-geostrophy, that, that equation is just uh, Q tilde N of Q1 should be zero, which is a very compact way of writing quasi-geostrophy. Um, you can unpack it, and we'll do it in a little while, but I want to say that what we've done is at a level where this could have been any operator L, so long as I could characterize its null space. This could have been any nonlinearity, so long as I had a differential equation. So nothing about this structure that I did or this argument has anything to do with QG. And that's sort of why this appears all the time. Whenever you have a weakly nonlinear theory, which is to say, whenever you have something that's linear and you know how to solve, and any nonlinear junk, you will always get an equation of that form. All right, so now let's get rid of this. Yeah. I haven't, that's right. <laughs> ah, so um, at formal level, I haven't used it. If you want to turn this into a theorem, you realize that you need to make um, so as I said, I'm not going to do the dot, dot, dot. I'm going to throw away that and then just keep a Q1 as a correction. So then I have to iteratively solve this. So you can think that when you enforce this, con uh, sorry, that's a zero. So what you want to do is think that you make a guess for what Q0 is, solve for Q1, and then you sort of iteratively want to solve and repeatedly do that, OK? The solvability criteria will connect the two. Okay. At that point, you realize that something has to be small for that iteration to converge. But that's only at, a, at, a, a, at the level of proving a theorem. At the formal level, it doesn't matter. Um, that's not to say you will get good comparisons with experiments if you don't keep epsilon small. <laughs> right? that's, that's, that's a completely different, uh, uh, different ballgame. Um, all right, so upon doing a number of integration by parts, you can show that this is entirely equivalent to So you unpack what this is in terms of its definition, throw all the derivatives away from psi, that's why you get derivatives over here, and then you say that this should be true for any psi. Well, the only way that would be true is if the integrand is zero. Right? So this has to be true for every function psi. And so then you end up with precisely uh, the following equation, dy u0 minus ddx v0 plus eta0 uh, plus a divergence of uh, 
I should be a little careful here. Keep in mind when you pull everything into a DDT, this changes appropriately. Okay. Um, this is nothing but the local vorticity, and this is a contribution from the background rotation. All right, so how do I know this is the local vorticity? Well, clearly it looks this way, but it's also the Laplacian of the stream function. So substitute the definition for what you know for u0. u0 is minus eta y. This is eta x. So this is entirely the background vorticity, and that's the contribution from uh, the Coriolis term. There's a nice interpretation of this, which is basically saying this entire combination of vorticity is constant along fluid parcels. That means you get to play a game of exchange where the fluid flow has a certain vorticity and it can sort of steal some background rotation to either increase or decrease its vorticity. All right, and the other thing, uh, what do I else want to mention? Ah, yeah, generalizations. Suppose I generalized. So long as this was a term at the same level as the nonlinearity, everything I said doesn't change. I have the same operator L, and then I change this. Um, maybe I write it with a different color. So the beta plane approximation would give me. By the way, that should be that. DG DT is DDT plus the geostrophic velocity of the gradient. Okay. And that's useful because at this level, the geostrophic velocity is actually defined in terms of eta. So this is a completely self-consistent equation. You don't need to go to higher order. Um, the usual derivation involves sort of this, uh, deriving the vorticity, so on and so forth. The reason I wanted to go this way is it's kind of natural where that comes from. It's coming from the solvability condition. The solvability condition sort of enforce, enforces you to take this particular combination. Okay. Um, let's make this an equation. I could have also had a bottom bathymetry, so I could have actually had H to be some capital H plus some eta minus some bottom boundary. So long as the deviations of the bottom boundary are small, right? small in the sense, let's say HB by capital H are small, and then keep that the same epsilon that I used here, my linear operator will be the same thing. And so then I can just go ahead and add that correction as well. Okay? I'll leave that as an exercise uh, for people to do. Um, it basically adds an extra term over here. Right? And what that basically says is, I've erased my picture of the, of the rotating planet. The bottom topography, if it's gentle, acts just like the beta plane. So you can sort of interchange those two ideas freely if it's a smooth uh, bottom boundary. Why does the beta plane uh, happen? Well, that's literally because these, the local normal component of the Coriolis, of the rotation, is changing as you go with latitude. If you had a local topography, once again, you should consider the local normal, 
And so again, you'll find a change in the background uh, rotation rate because the coordinate system has tilted a little bit. Right? So the background rotation rate, um, the Coriolis term, has a component due to the beta plane as well as background variations of um, the bottom, as well as variations due to the bottom boundary. And both of them are equivalent under this scaling. Violate this scaling, and then HB starts appearing in L, and then I have to redo the analysis. But the one benefit of so these sort of weakly nonlinear theories is the grunt work is actually understanding the operator L. Once you understand the operator L, this bit always takes the same form. Right? So remember, Q0 is defined as that which is in the null space of L. Q1 is that which is in the null space of L transpose. So you'll always have this structure. Um, maybe I have time to do that. Well, OK, maybe I don't. I'll just say it. Money talked about adding uh, stratification. You could. You could throw in another equation for density. But you want to make sure that the scaling is appropriate. Right? So if you allow uh, a density, you would have uh, a buoyancy term here in the Boussinesque approximation. This would not be true anymore, but you would still have hydrostatic law. So you'd have vertical pressure gradients balancing the buoyancy. Um, you'd also have to invoke the divergence relation in full, so you don't get to depth average anymore. But it turns out it has a very, very similar structure, and luckily money flashed what the QG th theory with stratification was, and that's how you exactly get those equations. Right? But in all cases, you always have this particular structure. Uh, the final take-home message I want to give is like, we sort of think that you know, linear theory is easy. Weakly nonlinear theory is just as easy. Fully nonlinear theory is hard. Right? That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a probably a, not a rigorous statement, but it's supported by a lot of evidence. Um, that said, what are my personal interests with these kind of equations? It was something that Mani mentioned uh, briefly. What are the large coherent structures that you can form? And are they stable? Right? Now, typically, coherent structures don't form in linear equations. Especially these type of linear equations just spread the waves away. If you want a coherent packet, you need a mechanism that prevents spreading or dispersion of waves. And usually that's nonlinear amplification. And so these type of differential equations, even though they're hard to solve the initial value problem, they're substantially easier to find traveling wave solutions, which are full nonlinear solutions. And then you might want to play a game, OK, so does the flow consist of big blobs and tiny radiation? And how do the big blobs on their own interact? Okay, so I haven't told you a lot about how we go about that theory, but really the starting point is to understand now the nice structural properties of the full nonlinear equation. Um, there are some nice things. Uh, the physicists will be happy once again. These are Hamiltonian PDEs, so they come with a whole bunch of structure that you can start exploiting. Okay, so with that, I'll come to a close. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, coherent structures can form so long as you have two competing mechanisms, something to move uh, waves away and something to br gather waves together. Typically, weakly nonlinear would also do it, it would be a, a very special equation for which there's an epsilon cutoff. Um, a lot of these equations also have some sort of scale invariance. So usually if you have a coherent structure at some scale, you can sort of zoom out and then get a coherent structure at another scale. Typical example is Korteweg de Vries. Ah, so what you need to do is make sure that the solvability condition, which is basically, let's set that to zero, this guy. So this has to be true. The nonlinear component 
projected onto the null space of the transpose has to be zero for every element in the transpose. Q naught. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so that's why I have this, com this entire expression only depends on eta. And I have an arbitrary function psi. Right? So I can pick any psi and construct something that's in the null space of L transpose. So it is a very generic psi. So in, for instance, you could pick a psi that's one in some region and zero everywhere else. And you could construct it however you want. And then basically that implies the term in the square brackets has to be zero. The only way the full integrand will be zero is if the term in the brackets is zero, because I can pick any psi. Pick a positive psi, uh, pick a psi that's localized in a certain region. Um, so you, you can argue that the only way this would work for arbitrary psi is if actually that is zero point. Um, and then the question is, can you solve this PDE for a given initial condition? Um, that's sort of well, well established. Uh, there are some nice theorems that say there's an initial value problem that you can solve. Um, I don't know if it's true for the equatorial beta plane. So that's something that I kind of put under the rug. I didn't want to talk about that, uh, partly because it does substantially change my operator L. When uh, the assumption is theta naught is zero, I can't keep beta small. Beta has to be big. And then I have to start playing around with the operator itself. Um, we can analyze the full operator, but the associated PDE kind of gets murky. Correct. 100%. So let me put that in a more mathematical framework. Suppose you found a solution to this. How do you relate a solution to this problem to a solution to that problem? So you would like the solution to this problem to be close to a solution to that problem. Turns out it will be close when epsilon, epsilon is small, and it'll be close for those times so long, so long as um, your time is less than 1 over epsilon. The solutions will be close. Eventually, they may start diverging. So if you want to make a rigorous statement about, I've solved an approximate equation, how does it even relate to the original problem? You have to sort of compare the two solutions and then try to prove a statement about when they're close and how long they're close. Right? And for certain types of problems, so for instance, in the water wave uh, problem, we have these type of theorems. We know that KDV is a good approximation to the water wave problem on some time scale with some type of initial data. Um, maybe someone knows this, but I don't know it for these type of equations. They're a little bit more complicated, and comparing things get a little hairier, but I don't know. All right, no other questions? Thank you.